Okay, let's um, talk about molecular orbital theory slash conjugated systems. Well, molecular orbital theory is um, nothing new. We've been using it in the past when we've been talking about resonance structures drawing. Um, that's been molecular orbital theory. When we've talked about nucleophiles and electrophiles, that's molecular orbital theory. Um, but now we need to do a little bit deeper dive into it because there are some things that need to be described by really looking at the complex patterns of molecular orbital theory, such as um, why benzene, when you treat it with bromine, get no reaction. Well, one thing you could use to describe it is benzene is highly resonance stabilized. That explains that. However, if you have an eight-membered ring and you treat it with bromine, you can draw the same type of resonance arrows for this eight-membered ring. However, this eight-membered ring actually will react with bromine. And if you use one equivalent, it adds once. If you add multiple equivalents, then it add, all the, the alkenes will eventually react. If you have another molecule like this, again, has the same type of resonance structures, and you have bromine, who knows what you'd get? Because this molecule right here is too unstable. Efforts to make this molecule have, have so far failed because once it's made, it immediately um, decomposes. And so who knows what this molecule would do with bromine. So something more than resonance is used to describe why benzene is so stable, but at similar molecules with similar um, resonance patterns are not. So we'll, we'll talk about that probably next week. But there are other things like um, This molecule right here is 1,3-hexadiene. It has a heat of formation of around 54.4 kilojoules per mole. Now, an isomer of this, like so. is one four hexadiene. The heat of formation of one four hexadiene is around seven hundred four um sorry, not seven hundred, seventy four point one kilojoules per mole. So when you're talking about heats of formation the lower the heat of formation, the more stable the compound is. So one for hexadiene has a much higher heat of formation, um, the difference there is 19.7 kilojoules per mole. So you could say that 1,3-hexadiene is 
seven kilojoules per mole more stable than one for hexadiene. And the only difference is the placement of where the double bonds is. So the evidence. So you have a molecule like this. And treat it with hydrogen and palladium. And if you're very careful and add just one equivalent of hydrogen, so for every molecule of this alkene you have, you add only one molecule of hydrogen. This product can be fairly cleanly made with the only alkene that's being hydrogenated is the end one. It's because this is what's referred to as a conjugated system. Where you have this pattern of double, single, double. Here's a conjugated system of 1,3-hexadiene. And the key to look at is that in this system, we have basically this pattern of sp2, 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 sp2. Or more importantly, we have this pattern of p orbitals all on adjacent carbons next to each other. That's a conjugated system. In the case of the 1,4-hexadiene, we have an sp3 carbon. sp3 carbons don't have p orbitals, so that breaks up the conjugation. So, now to talk about this, we'll need to talk about molecular orbital theory. And that's the idea that atoms aren't independent of each other in a molecule. Basically, atoms use their atomic orbitals together to make new molecular orbitals. So we've talked about this briefly in terms of um, the bonding and say, hydrogen. Where you have, each hydrogen has S orbitals and you, these combine together to come with two possible interactions. You have a bonding interactions where they're the same phase and anti-bonding interactions where they're opposite phase. And we have two electrons here, two electrons go here, and this is the molecular orbital diagram of hydrogen with two molecular orbitals. is the atomic orbital this is your molecular orbitals if you throw in two atomic orbitals in you get two molecular orbitals out now you can do the same thing with other molecules such as ethylene and you can do it with the sigma system, and you can do it with the pi system. What we are going to worry about is the molecular orbitals of the pi system. We're not going to worry about the molecular orbitals of the sigma system, or the single bonds. Those are pretty low in energy, and so aren't really going to help us with the, with the behavior. So we're going to worry only about the molecular orbitals of the pi system. So when we take ethylene, and let's go ahead and start a new screen.
we're going to just worry about the pi system. So each of those carbons has two p orbitals. Now those p orbitals can be in phase that's forming a bonding orbital or they can be out of phase that's forming an anti-bonding orbital and there are two pi electrons in this and so those two electrons when we fill in the orbitals we can fill in two electrons per orbital and so we fill them in right here in the bottommost orbital now in terms of energy this orbital right here has an energy the energy level of this orbital is roughly around minus 50 kilojoules per mole roughly around there this one up here is roughly around plus 50 kilojoules per mole we're going to define a new constant or a new unit value called the beta unit what a beta unit is is roughly the energy of a bonding orbital of ethylene which is around minus 50 kilojoules per mole so the energy of this level is beta and this level up here is minus beta because beta is defined as a negative number Now, the energy due to the pi system is the sum of the molecular orbitals multiplied by the number of electrons so in this case the energy is equal to two because we have two electrons in this orbital times beta plus zero because there aren't any electrons in the antibonding orbital times minus beta and so the energy due to the pi system is two beta units. Now, this right here, these two beta units, is considered to be the energy of an isolated alkene. So an alkene by itself. Now 
Now, some terminology when we're looking at this. This orbital right here is referred to as the highest occupied molecular orbital. HOMO for short. This orbital right here, the one right above it, is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO for short. Just some terminology. This terminology will become important later on. talk about 1,3-butadiene. One, 1,3-butadiene. Here we have four p orbitals. In a row. And so if we have four p orbitals, that means when we figure out the molecular orbitals, we'll have four molecular orbitals. Like so. And each of these has a different energy level. Now, if we look back at ethylene, the lowest energy level has no nodes. That's where we have a node is where we have um, a case of a bad overlap of a um, shaded against an unshaded. That's a node. So here is an example of a node. The more nodes you add, the higher in energy you go. In this case, in these four molecular orbitals, the bottom, the lowest energy one, has no nodes. The next one has one node. The next has two nodes. The next has three nodes. And you try to put these nodes in as symmetrically as you can. In the case of the bottom one, there's no nodes. So what you do is you pick one of the two orbitals to shade. The top one or the bottom one doesn't matter. So I'm going to shade the bottom one. And since there's no nodes, all the bottoms are shaded. Now we're trying to make this as symmetrically as we can. So therefore, here when we add one node, we're going to put it right in the middle. And so say we start shading the top lobe. So we shade that, that, we hit the node, and then we shade the opposite. In the next one, we have to add in two nodes. So we add one node here and one node here to be as symmetrically as we can. And if I shade the bottom one here, then I shade the top, top, and then the bottom. And then the third one has three nodes. One, two, three. Shade bottom, top, bottom, top. Like that. 
So here are the four molecular orbitals shaded in. Now we have four electrons in the pi system. And so we add them in, lowest energy first. So we add two here, then we add two here. This one is the highest occupied molecular orbital. This one above is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. When you're dealing with even numbered systems, so four carbons, six carbons, eight carbons, that kind of thing, it is actually relatively straightforward to draw out the highest occupied molecular orbital. So we have this as atoms one, two, three, four. This is a shortcut for drawing out the homo. We have a pi bond between atoms one and two. So therefore you don't have a node between those two. You have, a, you have just a single bond between two and three. So therefore you have a node between two and three. And then you have a pi bond between three and four. Ah, there's the homo. That's how you can quickly draw the homo of an even system. You can also quickly draw the lumo of an, of an even system by first drawing out the homo. And in the LUMO, wherever there's a low, there is a node in the HOMO, there isn't one in the LUMO. Wherever there, there isn't one in the HOMO, there is one in LUMO. What do I mean by that? There's not a load between one and two in the HOMO, so there is one in the LUMO. There's a node between two and three in the HOMO, so there isn't one in the LUMO. There's not a, lobe, a node between three and four in the HOMO, so there is one in the LUMO. And then you can just shade accordingly. Okay, so that's just a quick and dirty way of drawing these. For odd numbered systems or so, do all or when you have start to get greater number of um, carbons in there, chances are you'll probably need a computer to figure out the um, ones that aren't the homo and the lumo. Now, back to this. One thing that you can use a computer for is to actually calculate out what these actual energies are. And so this one down below is 1.62 beta. This one here is 0 0.62 beta units. This one up here is minus 0.62 beta. Keep in mind that beta is actually a negative number. So these values here are technically negative, negative, and these values up here are technically positive. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. Okay. So up here is higher in energy. Now to get these values, you definitely need a computer program or um, or there's a way of doing it by hand. I can't remember how to do it. Um, but um, you'll be using computer programs to calculate out molecular orbitals in Chem 344 quite a bit. And the program that they're currently using is called WebMO. And you will 
be using that quite a bit in the organic lab. So if we calculate out the energy due to the pi system, It's 2 times 1.62 beta plus 2 times 0.62 beta. And then there's nothing up above. And so we get 3.5 1.24, get 4.48 beta units, assuming I did that math correctly. Okay, 4.48 beta units. Remember, the energy of an isolated alkene is two beta units. So if we have two alkenes, two isolated alkenes, That'd be four beta units. By having these alkenes together right next to each other, you get 0.48 beta units, beta units of extra energy. Because instead of getting four beta units of energy, that's what would be two isolated alkenes, you get 4.48 beta units, a difference of 0.48 beta units. This is what's referred to as the resonance energy. By just having those double bonds next to each other. So, that's the energy of this. That explains why it's easier to hydrogenate an isolated alkene as opposed to a conjugated alkene because this isolated alkene doesn't have that extra resonance energy. This also explains My rotation of this single bond has a slightly higher barrier. I should actually put the arrows correct. Has a slightly higher barrier than the rotation of this single bond. The barrier of this rotation is roughly around. 24 kilojoules per mole, and this barrier is roughly around 22 kilojoules per mole.
The reason for this has to do with the presence of this molecular orbital. Because when you start rotating the carbon-carbon single bond right here, you're breaking the overlap between these two p orbitals. Okay. okay, now that's all I want to cover for today. Um, Friday's lecture is going to be going over the Diels Alder reaction. And that lecture is going to be. Um, awfully long, but what essentially it is, it's a reaction of conjugated dienes where you have a 1,3-butadiene reacting with an alkene and this alkene typically has what's referred to as an electron withdrawing group on it and it forms a cyclohexene. And this does not happen between just any two alkenes. You need a 1,3-diene to do it. And all it does is you heat it up, and in a single step, both of these bonds are made and formed, like so. But that will be um, for Friday's lecture. The um, reason I'm going to go a bit longer on that is there are some rules on this. Then if we have groups off of the conjugated diene in this, you typically have a set pattern of which diastereomer molecule you get. And so going through those rules is going to take a little extra time.